Well, hello. Uh, my name's Tina Jessen, and uh, I'm recording this from my hotel room here in Vegas. I'm here for the World Tea Expo. And for those of you that either missed it or did come in but just need a refresher on what we talked about, I thought I'd put um, it all down with the PowerPoint, with my notes going through uh, what we actually covered in the uh, in, at the event. Uh, so excited to be here. It's about 101 degrees outside, so it's nice and cool here uh, in, uh, in the hotel. So uh, my talk today is how to, talk, to turn a tea room hobby into a tea room business. But I want to start off by telling you a little story, if I may. Um, I'm going to get you to think back to 1988. For those of you that are old enough, obviously, uh, just to jog your memory, uh, just in case you can't remember that far back, the Pet Shop Boys were number one in the UK with Always On My Mind. Uh, then we had uh, Heaven Is A Place On Earth by Belinda Carlisle. Uh, Tiffany, I think we're alone now. And Kylie Minogue, uh, I should be so lucky. And uh, I am, I'm so lucky. Um, I own not one, but two tea rooms. Um, and I'm just, I'm happy to be here uh, in, in Vegas. Uh, always on my mind. Well, let me tell you this story. Uh, in 1988, uh, I was uh, dating a guy. Um, I was living in England and we drove from my home county of Derbyshire up to Yorkshire, which is just the next county uh, along. And uh, we went to a place called Harrogate and it was a Sunday afternoon and uh, we ended up in this beautiful establishment. I remember the walls being completely glass. It was a corner building, so all the way around the corner, completely glass. We stepped inside, we were greeted graciously and there was piano music playing, live piano music. Uh, in fact, it was a grand piano and a pianist uh, playing this beautiful, relaxing music, and we take them to our seats, and I looked over the menu, and it was the first time I'd had scrambled eggs with Scottish smoked salmon. Oh, it was so dreamy. And we were actually at Betty's Tea Rooms in Harrogate, and it was an amazing experience. And I remember thinking, my goodness, I would love to have this kind of experience. I'd love to own a tea room, probably by the time I'm 50, uh, to own a tea room, uh, to give this wonderful service. And the reason the service was so wonderful is all the servers, all the wait staff were girls, and they were from the ladies finishing school, no, no doubt, uh, in, in, in Harrogate. So they had most amazing manners, they were so gracious, and it was just a wonderful, wonderful experience. And for me, that was the first time I had had this experiential dining uh, happened to me. And I remember thinking, this is what I would love to be able to replicate, to uh, have this amazing opportunity to own a tea room like Betty's. That was 30 years ago, 30 years ago, where is time flown? But who would think I would be doing that in the United States of America? And when I was looking through these top hits of 1988, when I had that experience, the fact that I remember it for 30 years is amazing. But then I was looking at these hits and I'm thinking always on my mind. Well, it was. I mean, it was something that was on my mind and obviously sat there for a long time, kind of stewing away. Heaven is a place on earth. Well, yes, a tea room is a little bit of a safe haven and a little piece of heaven on earth. And that's what I'm trying to do. And I think a lot of tea room owners aspire to. And I think we're alone now because that's just a great time for connection. And uh, I should be so lucky. I certainly, certainly am. So today I'm wanting to talk about how to turn that tea hobby into a tea room business. So what am I going to be covering today? So I'm going to look at 10 tips on opening a tea room. If you haven't done that already and you're thinking of doing it, or if you're going through the process, maybe it's not too late to take uh, on board a few things that I learned in that process. Uh, and I have uh, opened a few different tea rooms and managed a few uh, over the last few years. Um, how to manage a tea room. 
Now, once you're open, you do need to kind of work on how you're going to manage it. And having a strategic objective and guiding principles has really, really, really helped me. Um, I only kind of discovered this about a year ago and it completely transformed my business. So I really want to share that with you so you're not having to go through the pain I went through for three years until I got this in place. And then also I want to cover how to market your uh, business. Uh, and I'm sorry for the pun, but I couldn't resist with visibility. Um, so that's what I'm going to be covering today. So this is a picture of my tea room in Carmel, Indiana, and it's in the winter time. So it's looking a little bit lost and forlorn there. But as you'll see, it's a 19, it's an 1880s built colonial home, uh, which has been converted into a tea room downstairs. And uh, it has um, uh, uh, rooms upstairs which are used by our. Oh. OK, I'm just going to ignore that because that just popped up in the screen. And Anyway, like I say, so uh, a beautiful colonial house been converted upstairs, artists, studios downstairs, all tea room. And I have about 50 seats uh, inside and a further 20 outside. A little tea terrace that goes all the way down the side uh, of the building and a few seats out front. Uh, but I don't rent, I don't own this building. I rent it. And there's a very good reason for doing that, uh, because once you put your down payment down on your rent, uh, sorry, down payment down on your mortgage, you're going to have no money left to do all the work that you need to do to get your business up and running. And having money in the bank is uh, really important when you start uh, something like a tea room uh, business, because we're bricks and mortar, and bricks and mortar does cost a lot more than doing things on the internet or just going to farmers markets, etc., etc. And as you're not uh, owning your building limits, please, 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 please limit the amount of money that you're going to spend on the building that you don't own. And if there's structural things that need doing, like floors or walls or divisions or, you know, really kind of big uh, items there, speak with your landlord and see if you can come to some arrangement. Um, I've, had, uh, my, I've had my landlord uh, change out my water heater. Uh, I've had them... Um, uh, change windows, uh, put decking out, replacing doors and locks. And so just push back as much as you can. If it's to do with the building infrastructure, that really should be uh, the landlord's issue and try and negotiate that as best you can. So we also look at the, uh, this is my team and my second tea room in Columbus, Indiana. You'll see it's a lot smaller. We have about 30 seats and maybe half a dozen outside uh, if the weather's not too hot. Um, and we're looking at the rent to revenue ratio. Now, I know I'm not going to drive as much traffic through this location. For one, I can't seat them. And for two, it's a smaller town that I'm in. So I don't expect it to hit the same volume. But that doesn't matter as long as your rent to revenue ratio, i.e. you're still going to make some profit, is really important. Um, so we, we look between 7 and 10% on that rent to ratio rent to revenue ratio, if only I could speak today. Okay, so uh, fourth tip, uh, retail, retail merchandise. This is something that a lot of um, tea room owners can come really unstuck on, and you have to be really, really conscious how much money you're actually gonna be tying up in your merchandise, as far as your stock holding is concerned. So you don't wanna be kind of buying heaps and heaps of stuff. Then the beauty with our Carmel location is we don't have very much space. So I can't actually order tons and tons of stuff. Um, so that means that my retail space is quite limited, which is not a bad thing, actually, because it means I don't have the stock holding, but it also means I have to be very selective on the things that are going to sell. And I would have thought Union Jack uh, napkins would have sold, but they didn't. Um, so it needs to be relevant um, and, we, and also price point conscious. We find things under $10 sell, over $25 don't. Um, so we obviously that helps us kind of guide us along the way don't have 300 t's if you can get away with 20 which is what we do because uh, again we don't have the space anyway so that's good kind of like well i don't have the space for all this uh, so you have to kind of be very discerning what actually goes there and it has to be relevant so i often get approached by companies that have all these wonderful accessories and housewares and mugs and jugs and sugar bowls and um, pictures and 
lots and lots of things and you can get quite carried away if you're not careful but it has to be relevant and having limited space is a good thing i'd rather have more seats and less retail but selective retail that i know is going to sell that's going to sell at a good profit margin and uh if, it, if i can't uh, charge 100% more for it, I uh, buy it in for a dollar and I sell it for two, then um, I'm going to save space for those items that I can do that with, because obviously why wouldn't I? It's, uh, you know, we're, we're here to make uh, money, uh, and that's, that's the big difference between doing a hobby and actually t doing this seriously uh, as a full business. Now, tip number five, uh, we have invested on on-site baking. Uh, for our business, it's really, really important. So I'm just going to take a, a little bit of a, a break and kind of drill down on this a little bit more because uh, I own a traditional English tea room. And for a lot of people out there, you might be thinking, well, you know, that's not what I want to do. Uh, old, English, old English is kind of old, old fashioned. Uh, it's not trendy. Uh, it's not uh, it's not riding a crest at the moment, you know, it's, um, you know, I want to do the latest and best new thing and I want to attract millennials and I, I want to do this and, and, and you kind of just um, almost, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, dismiss, you dismiss the, uh, the idea of a traditional English tea room. Now, obviously, I am, uh, my business name is Tina's Traditional Old English Kitchen, and I used to joke with people that, yes, I am English, I am old, and I am very traditional. And um, so for me, that is very authentic. Uh, and I'm not saying that you adopt it, but don't discount it, because yes, you could go after the millennials, and you could have your bubble tea and your matcha, but... Uh, and I don't do those two things because that doesn't really fit my demographic. However, I don't just serve old ladies. And, and I, I heard yesterday people saying, uh, "Gray, the grey hairs. Uh, we, we call them the, the blue rinse brigade. Ladies with grey hair, they kind of do this little blue rinse. In the UK, they do anyway. And uh, But, you know, it's not just for grandmas because grandmas have daughters and, 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 and granddaughters. And what we often find is that we're not just... Uh, looking at the older generation, we're actually looking at uh, two, three, even four generations of people come in. And it doesn't seem to matter to me how old somebody is when they walk through the door. They've all got a mum they want to bring. And I find that so funny. Um, so we have invested in on-site baking. Sorry, I went off a little bit there. Uh, but we invest on on-site baking, which means we do have to have the right equipment. It means that we do have to have some skills in the kitchen. Uh, to build uh, our team and uh, these are two of the ladies that have worked for me uh, in the past and Ellie uh, started off in the bakery in fact when we first opened in Carmel there was just three of us and one of those was me um, so I had Sunday front of house I had, I had Ellie in the kitchen she did all the baking and all the prep and uh, she's grown with my business over the last four or five years um, and she's now my general manager and she's loving it just as much as she was when she was doing the baking. She did get a little bit fed up of that. Um, so we have built a team and we have documented our recipes. And the reason I want to kind of linger on this a little bit more is because building your team is uh, really, 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 really uh, something that you have to do. Um, I have seen so many tea rooms in my uh, state go out of business because they have not been able to build a team and they've not been able to build their business to run without them being there. Let me just say that one more time. They've not been able to delegate to their team so they don't have to be there every day. Now we open seven days a week and people come to me, and, my gosh, Tina, you work so hard, you're open seven days a week. And it's like, I'm not here every day. Of course I'm not. How could I possibly be in, in two locations at once? How could I possibly? And the, the way you do it is you build your team. And uh, I've been very lucky. Uh, I was very lucky in Carmel. Um, but that was four, four or five years ago. And uh, it's, got, it's got harder. So when I opened my second location, I was so shocked. I knew I'd be able to sell the product and the service in the area. Uh, I, the, the demographic is really uh, multicultural there. I knew that people get tea and afternoon tea, and a lot of people coming from India, a uh, big engineering company there called, called Cummings. So I did that research. What I didn't, what I didn't realize was at 2% uh, unemployment, um, finding people that want to work, excuse me, hmm, 
was my biggest issue. <coughs> Excuse me. So, <coughs> so building a team really, really important. I'm sorry. <coughs> I think there's so much talking. I've been doing so much talking over the last few days, as you can imagine, um, being at the World Tea Expo. <coughs> oh dear me. So what I have done uh, within my business, and again, documenting is really important. Um, yes, you can. I mean, we have built training um, systems and training documentation. We have an operations manual. Uh, but what I would, what I realised is, if there's something happening, when I go into the tea room and I kind of just pop in, and maybe they're not expecting me at a certain time, um, and uh, I, I'm kind of observing how things are happening, and then there's a few things that are annoying me. A few things that annoy me and it's like why are we doing it that way why are they doing it that way it feels i've not written it down told them how i want it done uh, and i know it sounds so obvious but you have to kind of realize that and then then, then do something about it um so a couple of things that i did a couple of years ago uh was uh i documented something called my strategic objective and if i can just take a moment to read some of this and i have got copies for anybody that wants this and please 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 take it copy it highlight things that you like cross out bits that you don't um recreate it as yours uh but this gives you an idea of what i what on earth i mean about it by a strategic objective basically it's how it's putting on paper on one sheet of paper it's just one sheet of paper and um it's basically stating um, I suppose it's like, what would Tina do? What would Tina do? What is my expectation? And you know what? The team love this because it's it, there's no uh, there's no confusion. There's no grey areas. It just states it all uh, down as uh, as as we need uh, to put it down. So it goes. This is a one page strategic objective. It provides overall direction on all decisions to be made and how the company is to. Re to be run to maintain standards and quality of service to our guests. Isn't that just fantastic that we're stating how we want that to work? So in my case, Teams Traditional provides the most authentic British experience this side of the Atlantic, currently in Indiana. So I'm, I'm, I'm just in Indiana. It's a fun and friendly, relaxed, safe environment where families and friends across generations can reconnect with each other while unplugging from the stress of everyday pressures. The people system supporting documentation will be its focus. So I'm already setting up people to say, you know, we have this documentation and we're going to focus on that. Um, and by having a clear path supported by enthusiastic people who know exactly what's expected of them, the business goals will be met and our guests will be happy. I mean, it's so simple, but people just don't do this. Do we, uh, we do this by providing consistency in the food and drinks we serve and the overall experience that we create. The basis of the guest experience is our ultimate success on the processes, recipes and checklists we develop and the compliance with what we call the system. Uh, and failure to follow the system dishonours the team's traditional brand. So, you know, it's like, oh, I'm not going to bother doing that. I'm not going to follow following that 10 step process. I'm not going to bother saying those three things that we always say to people when they walk through the door. I'm just not going to bother doing it. When you do that, you're disrespecting the brand. And I'm building a consistent brand, especially having two locations. You need some consistency. So this whole idea of uh, not dishonoring the brand and having it written down so people know exactly what to expect of them. So we go on to say we create a family friendly environment where mothers, daughters and granddaughters, lifelong friends and new relationships can be nurtured and expressed, where old memories can be rekindled and new memories created. We enable husbands, fathers, sons and partners to treat their female family members and friends to the experience treasured, uh, to experience treasured special time with them. Our objective for, is for everyone to think of Tina's traditional as their special place. Isn't that just amazing? And the reason I came up with that is because people kept telling me, oh, we love Tina's traditional. It's our special place. And it's like, I want everybody to have that experience. I want everybody to do that. So we do what we can to create that wonderful, wonderful experience. Again, reminiscent to what I felt and what I still remember of Betty's Tea Rooms in Harrogate in England. 
So currently we do this in the state of Indiana and within the local communities of Carmel and Columbus. At the very core of what we do is to provide traditional authentic food and drink, education, etiquette and British history uh, by bringing British history and literature characters to life through the environment and events we create. Our business includes a structured mix of human and technology systems which flow information seamlessly through the business. Success depends on refined communication combined with organizational systems, dedicated staff, documented sales procedures, measurement, innovation, systems improvement, and measured marketing and relentless attention to detail. We build our team with individuals who are dedicated to teamwork, ethics, and outstanding service to our guests. Every day, and that's in capital letters, because you're only as good as you are on the day and you can never have a bad one. That's our aim. We are ready and willing to take direction by following the system in place to provide uh, consistency and quality for each and every interaction. And we go on a little, I'm gonna let you kind of read the rest yourself. So once we have the strategic objective, which basically just positions us in the marketplace, but more, more than a, a mission statement that goes out to, maybe goes on your website, um, this is an internal document which says this is how we all behave. This is the, um, the, uh, the strategic objective that we all follow. Leading on from the strategic, ob strategic objective are what I call the operating principles, the general operating principles. We have 20 of them. You don't have to have 20, you can have five, you could have 30, you could have somewhere in between. Um, and things are on here, I'm just going to pick out a few here. Uh, we, each employee has a can-do attitude in going the extra mile with a smile. Uh, if there are any reoccurring issues, we look to prevent them and they are raised so the system can be reviewed. So if we keep finding that we're having the same problem, then we change the system so it doesn't happen again. And we have a no blame culture. If we have a customer complaint, heaven forbid we have a customer complaint, we want to get to the bottom of it, what happened? Uh, was it a food issue? Was it a timing issue? Was it what, what made them uh, annoyed uh, and how can we prevent it from happening again and if that means changing our process and our system we will do that and we are always looking for continual continual improvement um, employee training is structured scheduled and thorough um, we avoid multitasking activities when communicating with others we're 100 percent present i don't want you to be on your phone when i'm talking to you put it down put it down now Oh, turn it down. Okay, you're fired. So it's just a standard that we all hold to. When we work hard at Tina's Traditional, keep our heads down, we focus, and in turn, the company pays well. That's the deal. We uh, The work week rarely exceeds 40 hours, so I don't expect people to work uh, longer hours, but when they're there, I really want them to work hard. Um, so we have those general operating procedures. Another thing that we um, have done uh, is document the recipes. And it's not just documenting them. I mean, we, we pulled recipes from all over the place. Some of them are our family recipes uh, that were handwritten in a book. Um, and we've pulled them all across and we have done cost analysis on them all. So we know exactly how much each item that we bake takes to make it and then we take those individual products and then we look at how we plate them and what dishes that that those menu options actually consist of so we know what's uh, an expensive item what's not an expensive item we've done it down to the penny and it took us a long time to get to that point now we use a company called cisco uh for our um for, for our buying, uh, our, our, our restaurant supplier, and they have an amazing system. It's not amazing, actually, it's pretty clunky, but we can put all that data into that system and we can pull it off quite well. So building your business beyond just you, it has to be, it has to be, it has to be. You'll see that this was, um, this was taken within the first month of opening and I'd already got five staff on board. And finding the right people and like I say my my biggest eye-opener for this was Columbus I've been so lucky in Carmel you know very highly educated um, uh, I don't know I just seemed to attract the right and I, I didn't really know how I did it I had to really sit down and think about this but finding 
the right people. We need rock stars and racehorses, not duds and donkeys. And uh, I'm afraid in Columbus we had some donkeys. I mean, people, and they would whinge and moan and bring the whole uh, energy down. And, uh, you know, it's a fun place to be. It's, you know, it's traditional. If you can't, you can't keep this pace and you can't be like, yeah, this is a fantastic place to work. And it's like, uh, then they're not going to last long with us. And, um, oh, let's get to head there. Look. <laughs> so um, defining your culture was really, really important for us. So defining the culture, we go above and beyond. We are loving and compassionate, not just to our guests, but to each other too. So we give people a little bit of leeway. We support them. So it's not, this is my job, that's your job. I'm not going to help you with your job. It's no, this is a team effort. Um, we're always improving. If we can find a better way, we will do. But I don't appreciate it in an interview when you tell me that you're going to come in and you're going to give me better ways of doing things before you've even looked at what, how we actually operate. So I don't appreciate that. Uh, but I do want a positive attitude. I want smiles. I want no gossiping. I don't want anybody uh, bad mouthing somebody behind somebody's back. I don't want somebody bad mouthing me. If you have an issue with something that I'm suggesting or a, a project that I'm looking to get off the ground, if you don't like it, talk to me. Tell me about it. Take it up the management ladder. And always speak up. If you think somebody's not doing something quite right or their attitude's needing an adjustment, or um, they've got stuff going on, I need to be aware of it because if I don't know about it, I can't manage it. If I do know about it, then we can do something about it. So speak up all the time. Mm. So I mentioned customer, uh, customer complaints. Uh, we don't get many. So when I get them, I take them so seriously. I mean, I really do. I mean, it's almost like, <gasps> Oh my God, it's a four star review instead of a five. What could we have done to make it a five star review? Now, a lot of restaurants are happy with a three star. Three star for me is a failure. Um, and anything less than that is, oh my God, what happened? But no blame culture. So it's what happened, what on earth happened, what were the circumstances of that happening? You are going to get a reputation online. I suggest you own it, own your reviews. So here we have Yelp. Uh, here we have Facebook. Now, Facebook is an interesting one because you should have a really good rating on Facebook because the people that go to Facebook find you usually on Facebook. They are your fans. So that's going to should give you the best uh, reviews of all. And uh, I think here we've got 120 reviews, a five star, and then I've got one of each on the other stars. So that's my Facebook page. And I'd expect that. And if it was less, I'm worried. I'm worried. This is a company called restaurant.com. We actually do, we don't do much discounting. I don't like using Groupon. Uh, Groupon uh, people uh, are, sometimes when you discount, you attract the wrong people that are only looking for a discounted service and we don't discount. I do restaurant.com because these are people looking for new restaurants to go to. So um, they're not necessarily just looking for the best deal. Um, so we do have quite a good reputation on there. Uh, and these are uh, our five star reviews on there. So tip number nine is uh, finding mentors. Um, you can try doing all this on your own, but quite frankly, don't. Don't, don't, don't go down there. You need help. You are, you can't have all the answers to everything. I was listening to something the other day, actually, and it was all about uh, everybody is ignorant at something. Nobody knows everything. I'm here speaking today. I've worked out a few things. There's lots of stuff I'm still working out. So um, you can't do it on your own. When I first opened my first tea room, I found another tea room owner who was in a different area of the country who was also British who also had a British tea room and I picked her brains and uh, we, we'd have telephone coaching um, several uh, sessions um, cost me a couple hundred dollars ago and uh, it was worth every penny it really was because it saved me so many missteps and of course coming to something like this where you can pick uh, other industry uh, where you can pick tea industry brains is great. So do training, do seminars, do workshops, uh, learn stuff. Um, 
find a mentor, look at continually improving, get a mentor to help keep you motivated, find a coach to take you through the steps. Um, it's really, really important to find a mentor. Mentor, And I have had business coaches, life coaches. Um, I've uh, had a Tony Robbins coach. Um, I've, um, I've, I really believe in coaching and mentorship is important because you don't know it all. And sometimes it's knowing what's the next best thing to do. Uh, and, and, and has this little slide shows, you know, you improve, you're successful, you more, you, you've got more chance of success quicker, which means you tend not to run out of money as quickly if you can do it quicker. Uh, training, motivate, work and inspire you to keep going. So I've got quite a lot already, uh, but this is like a big, big part, uh, which is my, uh, my tenth tip. Uh, market, okay, three things that any business needs to do, three things a tea room business needs to do, three things a tea business needs to do. You need to deliver or service your customer base, you need to service your customer, service your guests, deliver whatever it is you do, you need to deliver it, if delivery, service, it, it could be putting a plate of food on the table, it, it could be uh, replying to an email, uh, and we have set ways that we do all of that. Uh, and that was probably a hard thing for me to let go of because I used to love having that kind of customer interaction where they would ask me a question and I would reply. Uh, but now I've got my team trained to do that for me and it frees up my time so I can do the third thing on this list. So deliver to your guests. The second thing is control your costs. Control your costs and get your team to buy into what that means. Um, control costs, like at set budgets, that's something that we've, we've done recently, started to set budgets, you know, you've only got this much money to spend, so do you want this or that? Um, occasionally they'll come to me and say, well, we need to increase the budget a bit because of this, this and this, but that, as long as you know why you're increasing your budget and you know that your costs are going up because you've had, you know, or you've got these huge uh, reservations or this huge amount of work coming, coming through, then, um, then that's fine but know that you need to keep track of what you are expecting to spend and then compare what you've actually, uh, actually spent. Uh, and you need to have that as a percentage of your revenue, uh, but you have got to control those costs. So first deliver, second control, third is market your little tootsie off. Market your little tootsie off. And I was talking to, um, and, and I work with lots of different types of businesses, uh, but usually they are creative or food type businesses, creative food type businesses. And I was talking to uh, Joe's Butcher Shop, who's uh, just around the corner from me in Carmel. And we were talking about, you know, how's business going? I mean, we've had a such a, an amazing few months. It's like, my goodness, you know, you know, January, February, tough really bad weather in Indy, um, not many people through the door, but we had some strategies in place that helped us survive that. Um, and now it's like, oh my gosh, we've been so busy. And of course now it's starting to slow down now that the kids are off uh, from school. Um, but I was talking to Joe and he was saying, yeah, well, you know, this new thing that we're doing is working really well, but the old stuff's starting to fall off. It's because I'm not advertising. And I'm saying, advertise, you spend a lot of money out Well, we, we cut back last year with the expansion. and We're starting to feel it now. And it's like, why, why are you not kind of leveraging more, um, you know, media and, 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 and free PR and, 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 you know, we don't actually have an advertising budget at Tina's Traditional. We do everything through PR. Oh, well, if I was to do that, then I wouldn't be able to do payroll. I'd have to drop something and then be, I have to do payroll for goodness sake. And that's really important. And it's like, yeah, I know it's important. And we have a payroll company like you do. Um, to uh, to actually run the payroll, uh, but you actually put the numbers in. That's a bit of an administrative job, isn't it? Why why are you doing admin when you could be doing promotion? And he was like, oh, oh I've got a manager. I suppose we could, yeah, actually they could do that. Yeah. So free up your time. There's a there's a rule in business uh, business ownership. Only do what only you can do. And if you can hand it off to somebody else, do it so that you do the things that you are really, really good at, or really, really enjoy, or hopefully the combination of the two. Um, so marketing, you've got to free off the day to day to uh, really grow and develop your business. Because, and I always put it like this to my team, it's your job, it's my job to get people through the door. 
It's your job to make sure they come back. Now, so that's kind of a simple way of putting it, but it's true, isn't it? As a business owner, I want to drive the business. I don't want to spend a fortune on advertising, but I really want to drive business. And I, I come up with all creative ideas, and I'm, and their job is to deliver the base service so good that those folks come back again. And that way we build our customer base. And we have grown immensely. Um, I started, I mean, I've been in business now for over 20 years. I started in the UK with a home staging business. And we ran that, I uh, had 26 consultants nationwide, and we ran that as a, uh, a licensed operation. So my consultants didn't work directly for me, they were independent um, traders themselves. Uh, so it was, it was like having 26 mini businesses, um, and we had the documentation and the training. And um, so I, I had all that experience. But what it enabled me to do is other people did the delivery to my standard as though I was doing the delivery. And then it freed me up to do the marketing so that I could keep pushing business through uh, the system that I built. And I'm doing the same thing here uh, with uh, a very different business in a completely different country, um, and it's working. So how you market your business is, is absolutely critical. And I do have um, a free download uh, I have something called 20 ways for t room owners and the 20 ways are 10 strategies uh, for online and 20 strategies for offline that pertain to a tea room uh, and you, you look at this list and you go yeah doing that doing that oh, oh not done that one and you'll say well which one should I focus on and I will tell you Focus on the one that you're not doing. Something that appeals to you, think, oh yeah, I can see that really working. Oh yeah, I really get that. Well, that would be relatively easy for me to do. Start there and then gradually uh, make sure that you're doing all of those. So there's things like three ways to build your uh, email list. Uh, post a picture of today's special on social media. Um, we get reservation requests through Facebook, so it does work. Uh, but we need to have a system where we're actually checking Facebook. Um, manage your online reputation. I've already mentioned that, claiming your Yelp listing. There's a tea room down the road from me, um, okay, a few miles from me, and um, she's also a British tea room, and she's gone for a slightly different aspect than I have, and um, my customers probably don't like her that much, and her customers probably don't like me that much, and it's okay because there's enough customers to go around. But she hasn't came to Yelp page, and I've, learned, I've had more insight about how her business is defunctional because of the Yelp reviews. I know more about, and I've not actually been through this through the door, but I know she has challenges. I know she has a challenge because her kitchen isn't on the same level as uh, her tea room, and that wait times are long for the food to come out, and the food comes out cold because of that, and you know, huge challenges. And I'm thinking, goodness me, I don't think I would have actually gone to that location if I'd have realised all those things. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so. Um, Create a Google, you go, claim your Google page, free advertising. We do so much on Google and we get our hits through Google is just going up and up and up. Because when you do Tea Room Indianapolis, um, we come up number one on Google. It's an organic search, but then the Google page itself has so much going on there. So you click on the Google thing, you get pictures, you get things about our events, you get so much and it's all free, free is good. So 20 ways for Tea Room owners, I've got 10 items on on this um, and then I've got another 10 ways of how to do things offline because I'm a great believer and I think I even picked this up through some of the lectures and uh, seminars and sessions that I've been in over the last few days here at the World Tea Expo is uh, I've, I've had that issue I, I've kind of like people have been talking about doing things online doing things online but always 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 they say you do this online and you need to do this locally. You do this online, and you need to do this locally. You do this online, you need to do this locally. And that's exactly what I've got here as well, because it's not just about all being online, and it's not just about all being doing things locally. You need to do both. And when you do the both of them, they overlay so beautifully. Um, and what you hit here online, you miss 
offline, you pick up offline, which will never go online. So uh, the, the two things kind of merit really well. So I've got things on here like sending press releases, like doing etiquette classes, like inviting sen senior communities to come in, um, like uh, offering catering to realtors, lawyers and financial uh, accounting firms, um, street teams, taking samples out to businesses. Um, yesterday we uh, were talking about um, uh, mobile, take, take going mobile and going to where people are, uh, farmers markets. Now farmers markets are great if you can get in there, but because they're so popular, there's so many, it's so hard to get into farmers markets now. Uh, but why wait for an event? Why not just go to people's places of work, and take some samples along, take some sandwiches down to uh, your local realtor's office or your mortgage broker's office or dental office and hand some free stuff out and it will get passed around and um, hand out some business cards obviously as well so they know where it's come from. So all these strategies uh, have been used to help me build my Tina's Traditional Tea Room brand. Uh, um, my website is tinastraditional.com if you haven't um, found that already. So competition versus no competition at all. Um, we do this, I always talk about uh, the story, uh, but it's all about authenticity on one hand. So you're really kind of true to your roots. And for me, I'm British, I'm traditional, and I'm old. So old English kitchen was, worth, was, was what I want to do. My reason why, I want to create this amazing kind of safe haven for women to connect and reconnect uh, with their family and their friends. And uh, it is all about this idea of how can we connect on a personal level. Even if we're doing things online, we can do things on a personal level. We get people into the tea room, then we really connect on a really deep, physical, personal connection. I have people that I've never met before coming for an experience at Tina's, and they come up to me and hug me. And they say, thank you for being here. Thank you for providing a wonderful experience for me today. That was amazing. And it's like, Thank you. I wasn't expecting you to give me a hug. I'm British, but that's fine. And I am a real big hugger now as a result of all this. So authenticity is so important. We see, we, we're seeing authenticity coming up more and more in marketing and people are talking about this more. But this is something I was doing 10 years ago. And this idea of being so authentic and so true to yourself. I remember once uh, seeing um, a fitness, uh, a fitness uh, location owner. Uh, so she was basically a gym owner um, and uh, she was overweight uh, and she wasn't a good representation of her brand at all. I'm not knocking the lady for being overweight, but why would you go into the health and fitness market if you don't have wealth and health and fitness yourself? And it, it just seemed to be such a mismatch. And it's like, wow, really? You own curves? Okay, so it, it just, it was so unauthentic, it didn't inspire me at all to go and try out her facility. Um, so you've got to have that authenticity and where your authenticity lines up with your true personality, your spirit, your character, despite the pressures from being self-conscious about different things, what people expect from you, Precious the influences, um, and it, it kind of can knock you out of that kind of balance, that authenticity. Authenticity, get back in that. Your business will do so much better. Don't try and be something you're not. And I call this your unique me. Your unique me, um, and and in this, it's your unique you. But when you say it, it's my unique me, and, and it helps ground you. And it's your story. And you heard one of my stories. I actually create a number of uh, vignettes. So people often say, so Tina, how did you come to be in Indiana and places? Well, I'll tell you what, my husband came home one day, he works for Rolls-Royce Aero Engines, he's also British. He came home one day and uh, he'd been looking for promotional opportunities within his company. He goes, Tina, I found the perfect job. The problem is, it's in America. Oh, I said, where? Indianapolis, he says. Where, I say? And then he said Indy 500, and I went, oh, I've heard of that. Okay, let's do it. So that's one of my little vignettes that I will tell people as part of my story. 
and um, also how did you get started? How did you get started uh, with your tea room business? Well, I tell the story about uh, 30 years ago. It was only when I was kind of populating, so it's like, oh my God, that's 30 years ago. So it has a massive impact on me because I still remember the details. I remember what I ate, I remember the music, I remember how it made me feel. So much so that it inspired me to start my own business even though it's in America and the learning curve has been so steep. So having those vignettes, um, but also how did you start? Well, I started selling scones at farmers markets and I always say I built my tea room business on scones. I didn't build it on tea. I know I'm at the World Tea Expo, I feel a bit of a fraud because I didn't build my tea room on tea. Um, in fact, when I first started, I was selling scones at farmers markets. Then I moved on to doing catering. Then I moved on to doing other events from a commercial kitchen, which I rented. And then I started offering tea party catering. And I was using tea bags. I was using English breakfast tea, so pot with milk, or as we call it in England, milk. <laughs> as we call it in England, tea. Um, and um, yeah, so. It, I had to learn. When I opened the tea room, it was like, oh my goodness, if you've only had the tea, tea room, you've got to have a selection of teas. I better learn a little bit about tea. Um, and now we carry 20 loose leaf teas. Um, so having those little stories create that story. Um, my grandmother was, uh, well, I was raised in Bradley. Where are you from? I'm from, I'm from Bradley in Ashbourne near Derbyshire, about 100 miles north of London, right in the centre of the country, raised by my mum, my grand and my great grand. My great grand was born in 1899. At the time that Downton Abbey was set. Anybody here a fan of Downton Abbey? I go on. And my great grandmother taught me how to slice and butter bread, a skill I thought everybody had until I came to America. So, building those little vignettes, those little stories, give you an insight to who I am and why I do what I do and where my authenticity lies. And uh, you can create. Uh, stories around your food. That's one of the things that we do at Tea is Traditional. We have stories on every, we, we talk through the whole tier. We talk about coronation chicken salad being a, a recipe designed for the Queen's coronation in 1953. And yes, all my team learn this stuff because we can document it. We put it in our training manuals. It's part of what we do. It gives that experiential marketing. Every interaction with the guest is an amazing experience. That's what we aim for. So it could be our events, it could be the stories we tell, it could be the samples we give, it's how we engage, uh, how we offer and encourages people to buy. So that is all in the unique me. We have something called uh, Visibility Creator. I'm gonna have to wrap up soon. So um, the Visibility Creator system talks about how to get PR how to build and use your mailing list. And I have a mailing list about three and a half thousand. I remember actually when I got to 2000, it was like, oh, I was using a free service through MailChimp and which is free from till 2000. And it's like, oh no. So then I flipped it over to my website and I use Wix and I built my own website uh, and I have a mailing list and now it's about three and a half thousand. Um, and then you need to look at building your visibility strategy. So what is that going to look like? And that's going to include things like public speaking. And if you haven't done public speaking, get yourself down to um, the National Speakers Association or the Professional Speakers Association here in the UK or to Toastmasters and get some experience of doing public speaking because it opens doors. It also pays bills. Uh, writing articles and blogs and books. I do have a book, Tina's Traditional Book, uh, Tina's Traditional Book of Afternoon Stuff, Tina's Traditional Book of Scones, available on Amazon. I've written a book. I'm writing another one. Uh, effective social media. Uh, we do get reservations through Facebook. We do find Facebook is, is really good. We've started now posting via Instagram that then automatically posts into Facebook, but it has to be interesting. And some of our events that we do, leveraging shows and events is the last step, um, is looking at um, all the different events that we do. So we do historical events, we do literally literacy literature events. Uh, I've got a Jane Austen garden party coming up. We're doing a fish and chips night on Friday where we're using, you know, um, Guinness, beer batter, um, mushy peas. We'll also do some bread and butter so you can make a chip butty. Because in England, did you know that uh, in, in, in the US you have uh, a fish sandwich, so your fish goes in the roll and then you have fries on the side. In England, we do it the other way around. We put the chips, um, 
a version of French fries, in the bread to make a chip butty, and then we have fish on the side. So just little stories like that can be interesting. It's like, oh, wow, that's really cool. It's a different experience that we're offering. So shows and events uh, and looking how we leverage that and the stories that we tell through those so that we, and they go viral on social media, Harry Potter's birthday feast coming up at the end of July. So we have a whole separate menu for that and it's an evening event. And I know when I'm looking at uh, other businesses, tea room businesses for sale, I always like to see what is the motivation for the seller. And usually it's because they've burnt out or they're retiring or they've taken on too much. Uh, and they always say, evening opening, where well, you don't set up a tea room business to be a full service restaurant going into the evenings, because the two don't really go together. But you start to do evening events once or twice a month, then you could bring in like another Saturday's takings in one two hour event. Think about that. A Saturday, busiest day of the week, another Saturday squeezed in once or twice a week, a month. That is serious revenue. Uh, so looking at how you leverage your shows and your events. Now, I've been using the magnetic, uh, sorry, I've been using Visibility Creator System. I used it in my home staging business. I've been using it in my tea room business. But then I wanted to look at how can I 10x my marketing. I'm doing that. I do it through my magnetic marketing matrix because I was finding that I was doing some of these things some of the time. But to really leverage on your business, you need to create a plan, which is my magnetic marketing. You could call it magnetic, magnetic, blah, magnetic marketing plan, but matrix is better because it's not just a plan. You have what you're going to do, when are you going to do it? And if you haven't done it, then if you go back to this plan, and you go, oh, yeah, I've not done TV. I've not done uh, a press release. What? When was the last time uh, Tea Time magazine picked us up? Uh, what? Um, uh, what events are we doing? How are we reaching out into the community? So you to have this all down on a plan that you plan ahead of time. And there's some things that you know are going to happen. Like we just came back from Zubilation last Friday. Amazing event. Indianapolis Zoo's biggest fundraiser of the year. 300 restaurants participate in that. It's a free event to go. It's a free event to participate in. It's about $250 to attend, because that's the fundraising element of it. Uh, and uh, but you have to do like two, three, 6,000 pieces of sample. We went in, it's a hot day, it's June, so it's really, really hot. It's in the 90s and uh, people are drinking because there's alcohol, it's all part, free bar. Uh, so there's alcohol, there's food, uh, it's a balmy, evening starts at 5 30 goes on till midnight goes on till midnight iced tea ice we sold or not sold we sample um we gave away 1200 glasses um i think they were nine ounce cups of iced tea we reached a lot of people we got a lot of food in a lot of, uh, of our product into people's mouths and that's part of that experiential marketing and we have just an amazing opportunity in the tea room environment you can go into the community in events you can hold events in your location you can offer great food great tea you provide this amazing experiential marketing uh, concept and don't dismiss don't dismiss the traditional tea room because millennials are wanting the experience and that is something we can cater for. So yes, it's for grandma and for mum and for daughters and for granddaughters. We do mother and daughter teas. We do princess teas. It is amazing. So I've covered a lot of ground in an hour. Um, I am, uh, yeah, just about an hour. I'm really really please that motion could squeeze all that in so this is uh resources that you can use so um i do love helping other business owners i always have um i love the i i think it's probably from my home staging days where i was training i was setting the service standard not just for my business but for the industry we were we were groundbreakers when, when we first introduced the concept of home staging in the uk and i always like to think that when i was in the uk i brought an american idea and brought it into the uk market and now i'm living in the us 
and I'm bringing in a, a UK idea and bringing it into the US market. Now, yes, there's lots of tea rooms that are out there. There's lots of people that have probably been in the tea room business longer than I have, but I've really nailed how to market without having an advertising budget and then a stack of other stuff as well that's very relevant and pertinent to running a tea room business so you don't end up burning out. And I've come so close to the, doing that myself, but I managed to reach out to coaches and mentors and find a way through, which has built me a business, which means I've taken four days off this week to come to Vegas. I mean, that would not have been heard of in year one, uh, but by year four, it is becoming a reality. So some of the resources, the ideal team player, how to recognize and cultivate three essential virtues. The three virtues are, you need to be hungry, you need to be humble, and you need to have, they call it people smarts, but I think it's about really being self-aware and aware of the people around you. You can't be too self-centered as a team player. So those are the skill, those are the attributes we look for. We feel that because of our training program, we can teach the skills. Now, if you're in the bakery, it's helpful if you know how to follow a recipe. So there are some technical skills that you need. But if you're not a good fit, because I often say they could do the job, but no. And I'll let them go because I want good team fit uh, that buy into my core principles. Uh, work the system. That's where I got the whole idea of strategic objective and guiding principles. Um, it's an IT company, which meant something to me because uh, Sam Carpenter, that's how he's, that, that's his business. But it meant a lot to me because I came from IT um, and um, was able to, develop. you don't have to go through that pain, just borrow what I've got in there, cross out what you don't like, write in what you do like, highlight the stuff that's important to you that you'd like to adopt, use it, um, and I will send you those. Article, I've got an article on tinastraditional.com, I have a blog on there, I also have how to start a team in business. Uh, again, a lot of the tips that I've gone through today are also in that particular uh, blog. 20 ways to grow, uh, 20 ways for tea room owners to grow your business um, online and off, 10 online and 10 offline. You get a copy of that with the strategic objective and guiding principles just by emailing me. Let's change that email address to tina.jesson, J-E-S-S-O-N, at gmail.com, just in case tea room secrets isn't working because it's brand new. I do have tea room secrets as a close Facebook group. Uh, for Facebook Lives and Tea Room Tips, uh, and that's where this video is going to go. And also, I've now set up tearoomsecrets.com, and again, this video will be on there too. Uh, coaching, it's really it's really about business coaching for tea room owners, um, but it's also got some retreats in there. So you're basically coming to me, you can see my tea rooms in operation. I'll give you the insider story, the insider secrets on that. Um, and we can even go to the UK uh, if you want to see authentic English tea rooms and how uh, they are set up and that I'm not making this stuff up. Um, and then uh, visibility, visibilitycreator.com, it's a website that I've had for maybe 10 years now. Um, it has coaching and training on being seen um, and how to grow your business without paying a dollar in advertising. Um, so those are some great resources for you to use. Please reach out. Um, I was asking, uh, sorry, I was um, looking at some um, material earlier today and uh, I came across a great quote uh, and it went something along these lines. So I do, do apologize, I haven't got it quite down. Uh, but it was along the lines of, the better the questions you ask, the better your results in life. The better the questions you ask, the better the results in life. So if you have a question, ask. Don't you feeling embarrassed or thinking like it's a silly question? There are no silly questions in business. If you have a concern or a question, ask it. Find out a, an answer. And if you can action on, on, the, uh, on that answer, do it because it will help improve not just your business, but your, your life as well. And um, my objective is to 
really help tea room owners not be the ones that burn out after three years, not be the ones that get ill and have to sell, not be the ones that are taking it all on their own shoulders, that don't know how to delegate, that don't know how to structure the business. Because we're all passionate, we all want the same thing. And because tea rooms are localized, there isn't really any competition. And if you also layer that uh, unique me concept where you're authentic, authentic to yourself and you build your own story, then people will be attracted to you because of who you are. And that means there is no competition. So I'm really happy to give out as much information as possible because what's important is that the tea room movement keeps its momentum and that there is a tea room in every city, in every state, in every country where people can go and it's a safe haven where they can reconnect with people on a physical level, you know, forgetting the, 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 the social media, but actual true connection over a cup of tea and a slice of cake if you're running a tea room. And, um, and we have just this amazing ability to create not just, you know, good food, good service, because to be honest, if you can't do those two, you shouldn't be in business anyway. But as a tea room owner, you can elevate that whole experience and really create something special and memorable. And that's what people remember 30 years later, just like I did uh, with Betty's tea room in Harrogate. So please ask the question. Don't try and figure it all out for yourself and don't think that other people, yes, they may borrow some of the ideas. It doesn't matter. They're not directly competing with you anyway because people will be drawn to you by your unique me, uh, your unique uh, story and who and what you actually stand for. And that is the new way you're going to get, not just get the grandmas and the mothers, but you're also going to get the millennials and the news and the, you know, the, the five year olds that you're going to do etiquette classes for and how to hold a knife and fork, which they will remember forever. And we have just that amazing, amazing ability. And I'm rambling on now. So I'm going to wrap up. If you want to reach out to me, do so. And um, uh, maybe I'll see you next year at the World Tea Expo. Um, uh, and if not, maybe I'll see you at one of my up and coming retreats. We have got some uh, some really fun stuff coming up as far as uh, baking classes. And then we have a whole business um, retreat coming up in the new year. So um, I'm Tina Jessen. <laughs> this is the World Tea Expo here in Vegas. I still don't believe I'm here. And I will see you soon. Bye for now.